Good morning. Good morning. You join us in our self-isolating kitchen whilst we're having breakfast. I hope you've just been doing breakfast bird watch with the RSPB, which runs from 8.30 till 9 every morning. People recording lots of the birds and other wildlife that they're seeing and posting that with the hashtag breakfast bird watch. Today, however, we are expanding our reach around the world. We're joining with Bird Forum, and you can find Bird Forum at birdforum.net. It's the largest internet birding platform anywhere in the world. And today they're doing their great backyard bird watch. So we're trying to encourage people on the Self Isolating Bird Club and on Bird Forum to record the birds that they see, not necessarily in their garden, but if you're taking a bit of exercise today, keep your social spacing, don't all rush to the beaches. Um, but if you are doing your exercise and you see any wildlife, then post any photographs that you get, any reports that you get onto the Bird Forum, the South Isolating Bird Club thing here. They're hoping that from Alaska to Zanzibar, from A to Z, nature lovers will compile checklists, take photographs and share stories of their encounters of birds and other creatures. So that's all good stuff. Uh, obviously, across the world at this time, both in the Americas, and here, migrant birds are on the move now. We've heard that cuckoo have been seen here. Swallows have clearly been seen in the UK. Black cats are turning up. Some of those might have been, oh, no, they will be turning up, actually. Our black cats moving back into the UK. And we've got um, our camera outside ready to cut to, should anything interesting turn up. Just a great spot. He flew in. Oh. He was hanging around by the bush. He took one look at us and flew away. So right. we'll keep an eye on that and uh, if you go, oh, if we go, you come on the roof. Okay, all right. Stay still. Stay still. See what happens. Um, and he's gone. Okay. <laughs> we'll keep going and try and laugh on this. Okay, and then what else have we got to do? Well, today? of course, on Twitter, you can also follow Sound Approach UK. They're posting daily songs of birds from around the world. And I've gone through their Twitter and I've pulled out one which I thought was particularly fabulous from a few days ago. This is the song, have listen, I've got my laptop here. And um, of the great grey shrike. Have a listen to this. Oh, I don't know if you guys heard that over here, but I think that's a beautiful song. It's it's a very amazing delicate. Song. Amazing it's very song. delicate. But of course, the great grey shrike are the largest of the European shrikes. You will see them in winter time on the east and south coast predominantly. But at this time of year, they will be making their way back to Scandinavia where they'll go to breed. But amazing birds, they're so beautiful. They've got that distinctive black, oh, stunning birds. Like bandits, aren't they? They are like bandits. They are like bandits. Beautiful, beautiful like cold colour. Oh, stunning. I used stunning. to watch them out on the heat in the New Forest in the 1980s when there were a few more of them about. Um, and they're quite ferocious predators as well. And I remember on one occasion seeing an unfortunate blue tit fly out of a block of woodland and head out over the heath. Couldn't see it was a blue tit at the time, just a very small bird. The shrike went straight up in the air, grabbed it, brought it back down. Then I got my telescope on the shrike and it had killed this unfortunate blue tit which was flying around. Oh, so yeah, yeah happy, small mammals, obviously in the, in the summertime they'll go for lizards and all sorts of things. So for a small passerine bird, they are ferociously amazing, predatory. Amazing. So make sure you go and follow Sound Approach UK on Twitter. It's fantastic. Every day, new bird song. Should we do Skull of the Day? Let's do it. Right, here is today's skull. The photos have been posted online too. There we are. I lean forward to that. Look at that. It's got uh, a relatively sharp, but not hooked, but nevertheless very strong and robust bill. It's also got relatively large eyes. And what appears to be a small brain at the back, but that might be deceiving. Look at that one. And this is a bird, again, which you can find all over the UK in a couple of different forms. Um, and in mm -hmm. fact, it's a member of a group of birds which are highly successful all over the world. So if you are watching in Zanzibar, you will have them. And if you are watching in Alaska, you will have these types of birds there. Slightly different species, but essentially the same bird. Pretty smart. They bird. are really smart. Very noisy. Very noisy. Great spot. Great spot. Oh, he's... Oh, we have uh, the phone that is on the bird feeder. It's plugged into a battery charger just to make sure we don't lose connection. It tried landing on the cable of the battery charger. And quickly, obviously, that wasn't going to support its way. It's a little pretty quick, but it is hanging around. It's definitely wanting to come in, so we'll... Um, yeah, we'll stay quiet and as still as we can. We've got great tits coming in, cold tits, there's great tit there, another great tit around the back, blue tits are still coming in, of course. 
saw a little marsh to it earlier, but the one thing that we're seeing this morning that we didn't see the last time we put the camera outside are some siskins. There seem to be a pair of siskins here. I had a beautiful male in a few minutes ago and a rather duller female, but nevertheless charming. So hopefully we'll get some views of those as we crack on through. It's fun. Uh, what do you think? Okay, I just don't feel very well today. Oh, and I think I've got a really good idea about why that might be. Take a look at what happened last night. There is a very, very rare animal in the kitchen doing a behaviour that I have never, ever seen before. We've got to sneak in very because we will disturb the animal in its prime habitat. Are you ready? Hey Chris, what are you doing? Uh, so I've just knocked up a little something special. I'm using some of my favourite ingredients, uh, including Tabasco and um, Tabasco. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, all the ingredients are fresh. They're fresh out of a jar. <laughs> the vegetables all fresh. And um, I'm I made, so worried. I made the pasta myself. If I'm not on the show tomorrow morning, the next day, you'll know why. Coming from a young person who I nutritionally nurtured for years. Yes, and and using the microwave. No, that's not true. <laughs> Besides which, I'm thinking about doing my own cookery uh, book. Oh no! That, Actually, who wants, who wants let to me rephrase that? that. I'm thinking of doing my own cookery sheet. Just the sheet. Paragraph. Anyway, you can't you can't complain. At least I made an effort. Anyway, so I've come up with a bit of chat with a challenge that I thought Chris and I could do. We've had amazing artists come on, and you guys have been sending in your drawings and paintings. And they have been fabulous. So I thought we'd have a little bit of a competition. Chris, get your sharpie at the ready, please. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a bird. I think we've gone for blue tip. We're both going to draw a blue tip. Um, and you guys are going to tell us who you think is best. But there is a catch, Chris. Pop that one. We're going to have 60 seconds to draw this. Blindfolded blue tip. Blindfolded blue tip. So um, I think there's going to be a countdown coming up on your screen. Oh, wait a minute. So this is something you could try at home, um, yeah. you know, with your children. Um, I suggest that you get them to do it for two and a half hours. So <laughs> if you've got them to draw blindfolded quietly for two and a half hours in the corner, that would be a fantastic idea. Okay, I think you ready? I'll be ready. Tell us, is the count gone up? Okay. Ready? Two, one. Two, one. This is really difficult. I'm not sure how this is going to go. I think I'm drawing the wrong end of the yeah, pen. I think I've got a week. This is really difficult. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying. I'm trying to. I mean, I'm doing foliage. Do you know, are you? I'm doing foliage. You can't, I'm I've got to do some foliage. foliage. Yeah. But uh, mine's on a branch. Okay, now I'm just going to try and write a little bit right here. If I'm drawing on the kitchen worktop, who's cleaning it off? <laughs> okay. Right. I'm, I'm, oh, we got. Okay, are we ready? I'm pretty done, actually. Yeah, I'm quite done as well. Okay, right. Like, you know. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yours right, looks like an aeroplane. Yeah, okay, well, there, there you go. There's, there's, I'll hold mine up. There we are. I did at least get some foliage in. Uh, the beak's in the right place and the eye. Yes, um, yeah, go on, have some look at yours. Hold on. <laughs> what? Let's have a look. Yeah, okay. I'm claiming, I'm claiming victory on that one. Why? Well, I, I don't know. Mine, mine looks more, I, slightly more anatomically correct. I even had blue 
Oh, Did you have blue? No, I didn't realise it. I was. had yeah. a secret sharpie in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a secret recipe for tonight. That's a, that's what really matters, I think. Anyway, on from silliness from hands. Um, yesterday, I got sent the most amazing clip from a friend of mine, Dan O'Neill. He recently has been out trying to find one of the world's most rare raptors. And um, we're not sticking in the UK. This is a bird which is definitely not from the UK, but it is one of the most sexiest animals I think alive. It is beautiful. And it's an amazing clip. It's about the story of the Philippine eagle and his experience going out to try and see one. So here's the clip from Dan. Hi Chris, hi Megan, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm here in my uh, little garden in Bristol listening to the birds and enjoying the sunshine. But I'm so excited to talk about what to me is the most incredible bird in the entire world, the great Philippine eagle. Philippine eagles are absolutely incredible. They're entirely different evolutionarily to all of the other large eagles, the stellar seagull, the harpy eagle, the white-tailed seagull we have here in the UK, completely different. And you can see it immediately when you look at them. This giant, great, big, prehistoric, dinosaur-like beak, beautiful coloration on their legs, browns and tans and whites, and these giant, great, big, seven-foot-long wings. They're one of the largest wingspans of all the forest eagles in the world. But for me, personally, what I find most amazing about them is that they are the only eagle in the entire world that has blue eyes. And you can see through those eyes so much character and personality, and it's absolutely amazing when you see them up close. But sadly, they are possibly the most endangered eagle on the planet. They're critically endangered with around 400 or fewer nesting pairs left in the wild. And they're really difficult to conserve because they have such interesting, very different biology. They live in deep jungle. They're really difficult to find. And when you're looking for nests, which is really important for their conservation, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. They need around 4,000 to 11,000 hectares of forest to breed successfully. They're incredibly territorial animals. They only lay one egg every two years, and they reach sexual maturity at around five to seven years old. So it's a whole host of things that make them really difficult to conserve, and it's one of the large reasons why they're critically endangered today but they would probably be extinct today if it wasn't for the incredible work of the Philippine Eagle Foundation. And it was actually them that contacted me last year and told me about this insane, crazy, crazy story that led me to go to the Philippines and film this one bird called Masim. She was found uh, drowning in the ocean. She'd been driven out by another pair of eagles, most likely, uh, and she'd landed on a boat and then couldn't get back into the air because there were no thermals for her to catch. And so she fell, plummeted into the water and was then miraculously saved by two fishermen who picked her up, had no idea what to do with her. So they tied her to a tree on the beach uh, and then she was picked up by a local politician and tied to a tree in her back garden before she was rescued uh, and brought back to the Philippine Eagle Foundation to be rehabilitated and to be sent back to the wild. Unfortunately, uh, there's this general uh, ubiquitous flora, a fungal pathogen, uh, that really doesn't cause much of a problem for birds unless they've got a suppressed immune system. And all of this stress of Masim being moved from place to place really lowered her immune system, and this fungal pathogen took hold in her lungs and caused an aspergillosis infection, uh, which very sadly, as we arrived, led to her death. Uh, which was really, really sad, absolute blow, because as you can imagine, so much genetic diversity is tied up in every single one of these birds. All of these rescues and rehabilitations and releases back to the wild are so important because every single bird is vitally important for the survival of the species. After Masim passed, it really became about what can we do in her legacy, because that forest that she was going to be released into was going to be protected in her name. And then after she died, it was all thrown into whack. No one knew what was going to happen, and we really just wanted to be there to kind of help the Philippine Eagle Foundation and figure out a way that we could protect that forest in her legacy. And so we met the local communities, we met the mayor. We really hope, we've got fingers crossed, that actually we're going to be able to protect that place. And in the future, another bird that's rescued and rehabilitated will have a place to go that's protected and big enough for it to have its own future. Before I left, I went to meet a community whose eagle uh, had been released, had been successfully sent into their forest and had his little radio tracker fitted and a little backpack so that the Philippine Eagle Foundation could log where he is, find out lots of really, really important data. And we went up, we trekked up really late at night, set up our camp 
and then kind of with lots of nerves and uh, expectations for the morning. And then we woke up really, really early at the crack of the world, before dawn, and climbed up the rest of the mountain. And then we sat as the sun rose and slowly lit up, sparked all of the trees around us. And we, had, we were moving our eyes across every single tree, hoping to catch a tiny glimpse of him. Couldn't see him across anywhere. And then, fantastic film-like moment, he just soared straight into our vision, gave two incredible uh, loops around and then disappeared off back into the forest. And it was just such a powerful moment and just shows exactly what the Philippine Eagle Foundation are trying to protect, this amazing, prehistoric, fantastic looking creature. Um, yeah, absolutely amazing. And if anybody ever gets the opportunity to go there and see those eagles, they absolutely should. Um, but yes, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved talking about these birds. I'm so passionate about their conservation. And if anyone wants to find more information about them, please visit uh, the Philippine Eagle Foundation's website, which I'm going to put here. Um, and yes, thanks again. Cheers, guys. Speak to you soon. Absolutely astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. What an amazing bird. Amazing story. Great little clip, Dan. Thanks ever so much. There's only one thing that needs to be done at this point. Step back, Mix. Well, oh. honestly, <laughs> Philippine eagle. Okay. Seriously, <laughs> one of the best birds in the world. Fantastic for us to get that on today when we're joining with Bird Forum. Remember, you can join them at birdforum.net for the great backyard bird watch. Imagine you're in the Philippines and you get one of those in your backyard. But at least we've all had a chance to see them today. And Dan's response to seeing it is just amazing. I know, I know. I love that. And you can follow Dan on Facebook at Dan O'Neill Wildlife and Adventure to keep up to date with everything that he's doing. Honestly, it's, it's brilliant. That's so brilliant. good. That was absolutely incredible. Anyway, look, uh, there was a vote. There was a, a poll on Facebook as to who did the best picture. And I'm told, Max, that... Uh, my little blue tip, drawn blind by the dead, got 59%. And given that there's only 100% in the percentage stakes, that means you got 41. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not big for that or anything, but <laughs> I mean, And fine. also, we're also told that one person voted for Megan 20 times. So if you are, so yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> so that, that's a rigged vote. Oh, great spot, great spot. Oh, okay, oh. Let's, let, let's have a look. Let's see what we get on the feeder for a moment. There we go. Okay. Great tip at the top. Great so okay. these birds are definitely great spot. Yes, he's on the wrong side. And he's sort of halfway there. Yes. Can you see him? You can see him. Oh, oh what a beautiful bird. Oh. So obviously, activity at the feeder has decreased over the last couple of weeks. The simple reason that many of the birds are moving away from the garden to breed. These great tits we've got about 20 boxes around the garden so we generally have about five pairs of those great tits so i imagine there probably are local birds which are establishing their territories at the moment looking for their breeding uh, sites they've not started breeding yet uh, they're probably some of them at least building nests we've seen on uh, the south west lake bird club what a treat yeah and even even though that the bird feed is getting slightly quieter it's still important to keep your food out look at that oh, amazing it's still important to keep your food out because of course you know it's still a really valuable resource for these birds and especially as their chicks hatch they start to grow and they start to become independent it can be really really valuable um you know a, a, a reliant resource for your feeders as well i mean look it's sensational so look no red on the head which means that it's the female bird, the great spot male has a, a red band on the back of its head. And for our American viewers uh, here this morning, um, obviously in the UK, our woodpecker fauna is a lot more impoverished than yours. We've got the green woodpecker, the great spot woodpecker, and the lesser spotted woodpecker. Um, we've got all your sap suckers, got the pileated, Pileated um, woodpecker, red cockaded. I mean, the, the American woodpecker fauna is absolutely sensational. Some of the most wonderful birds in the world. Some people still thinking that the ivory billed woodpecker is out there in those southern states, of course. Been controversy about that in the last few years. Wouldn't it be great to think that it is still out there? Amazing. That's another incredible bird. So that's not bad. Not bad. Great spot. 
I'll I'll tell you what, morning. we want an international flavour today, so I'm very mm. pleased that we can rejoin my Spoon Watch mucker, um, well, in fact, a mucker that goes back very many years, the mm. one and only Michaela Strachan, who is in Cape Town, self-isolating in her home in South Africa, and she's been looking at her garden birds as well. Michaela, are you there this morning? We'll whisper a little bit because we don't want to scare that woodpecker on. Press the button. I don't know what I think about mucker, Chris, <laughs> but can I just tell you, you two drawing your birds blindfolded is better than the sort of picture I would draw without a blindfold on. So I'd like to give you both a little bit of a round of applause. However, let me tell you all that my cooking has always been way better than Chris's. I've known and worked with him for about 30 years, never ever seen him cook a meal. <laughs> Anyway, as you said, I'm in Cape Town and we're locked down, as I told you last week, if you were watching. Um, we're in day 10 of lockdown and it's it's quite interesting. I'm really surprised there's not been more on the news in the UK about South Africa, because this time last week, there were 1,170 cases, confirmed cases of corona, and just two deaths. This week, a week later, 1,585 and nine deaths. So hasn't really gone, I mean, terrible that there are nine deaths, but it, it really hasn't gone up that much. So I think the world is sort of watching South Africa because maybe our early lockdown is working. Or maybe just, this is just the calm before the storm, I guess. We won't know. Only time will tell and let's hope it's good. Anyway, going slightly crazy. I am just going to say, Chris, if you can hear me, I can also hear you. So if you can just mute your because that's a little bit off-putting to be able to hear you. Thank you very much. OK, so we're in lockdown, day 10. Everyone's going a little bit stir-crazy. And as I told you, our lockdown is quite severe. We're not allowed to uh, go out our houses except for food and to go to the chemist. So um, we're not allowed to go for our, our daily walk like you are in the UK. We're not allowed to walk our dogs. We're not allowed to buy alcohol. So we've had to all come up with a plan and uh, I've got two dogs um, and so this is the plan that I've come up with. Look at this. This is what I do to keep the dogs and myself fit. I run around the house. So I go out the front door, I run around the side, through the garden, through the back door, up the steps and round again. And we do it about 10 times or maybe if I'm feeling really fit, 20 times. So that's my dog walking with me and my two dogs. And I'm not just in lockdown with my dogs, I'm in lockdown with four chaps. And while I'm getting creative, trying to think of ways to keep fit, they're getting competitive. Look at this. There's a great table tennis tournament going on in the garage. We've got my, my partner, Nick, who's a cameraman there, um, twin stepsons, Tom and Sam, and my, my own son, who's 14 year old, Ollie. And they're also doing garden cricket and garden football as well. So that's what they're doing to keep their minds occupied. As I say, everyone is going a little bit stir crazy. And while we're stuck in our houses, of course, our wildlife is having an absolute field day because there's, well, there's less people, there's less disturbance, there's less pollution, the skies are clearer, there's less noise. So they've been really enjoying themselves in our gardens. And if you're like me, you're unlucky enough to have a garden or even a, a wild patch that you go to on your daily walks in the day, you will know that in this time of complete sort of chaos and anxiety and stress, take time to go into that little world sanctuary. You go there, oh, take a deep breath, and you just feel so much calmer and so much better and so much more red. So I think a lot of you have been enjoying that bit of watching. I saw the tiny little quiet patch of my garden. And when I was on this time last week, I introduced you to three of our very common garden birds. And I'm going to show you four more now that we're regularly seeing. In the UK, you get your robins. Well, here in Cape Town, you get this bird. It's a Cape robin chat. Now, the robins in the UK have that red breast. And our robins, our Cape robins, have a beautiful orange breast. And I often see these robins, so I look out my window and they're, they're foraging on the ground, they're looking for insects and worms and lizards, maybe even a frog. But you can see this one is perched on the side of our bird bath. And I love the way its tail pops up and down. 
But um, it's been really hot this week here in Cape Town. We're just enjoying the last of our summer weather. In fact, I hate that sally here in the UK, but we did get to about 27 this week. Temperatures really dropped over the weekend. And there's a lot of wind as well today, which is why I'll come onto my veranda, because it's a little bit more protected from the wind. But hopefully the sound is going to be better on this live stream. But that's a little robin. And it's interesting, because in the books, it says that it's shy. But clearly, our one has got habituated to us and the garden because it's not at all shy, it's very bold and quite confident. Unlike some of the other birds we get in the garden, including this one, have a look. This is the southern boo boo. It's shy, it's skittish, and it can be skulkish. And I love that word, skulkish. It's because it stalks around in the bush and the shrubbery, um, foraging for food. But you can see it's, it's out on our bird feed there. Uh, it takes a lot of patience to get this shot. So thanks very much to my partner, Nick, who spent a lot of time trying to get a boo-boo for me to show you. Um, and you can see that the beautiful bird, uh, it's named after the sound it makes. And they have a duet sing song that they do between the male and female and typically it's the male that will start it and it can it can sound a little bit like this and then the female will be now anyone that knows boo-boos and knows their sound will think that that's a terrible interpretation but the thing is they have a huge variety of duets that they do so it's very very difficult to actually pick one out but you get the general idea and that's where they got the name from the name they're quite aggressive birds. They're closely related to fiscal shrikes and they can predate on other fledglings, but they don't get it all their own way because they're also a host to cuckoos. Now, on spring work, Chris and I have shown you in the past European cuckoos that um, lay their eggs in birds' nests. I think the one that we showed on spring work a few years ago was a reed warbler's nest, and a cuckoo lays its egg in that nest. It's called um, it, 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 it's, oh, I forgot what the name is now, but anyway, it, it lays its nest in, it lays its egg in that nest, and that's what they do here as well. So it'll be a bird like a black cuckoo, will lay its egg in the boo boo's nest, and then that cuckoo's egg will hatch first, and then it will proceed to kick out the eggs of the boo boo. It's quite remarkable behaviour, and then that cuckoo will be fed by the boo-boo parent. And as I say, we've seen that on, on Spring Watch in the past. It's called, well, it's called a uh, nest parasite. That was the word I was looking for. So the cuckoo is a nest parasite, which will parasitize that nest with its own egg. As I say, remarkable behavior. Now, last week, I showed you one of our beautiful sunbirds on our feeders. I'm going to show you another one. Last week, it's the orange-breasted sunbird. This week, it's the lesser double collared sunbird. And just look at this bird, look at the colours. It's called double collared because it has a, a red collar. And just above that, it's got that sort of very thin purpley blue collar. And then that metallic green head and those beautiful colours in the sun. The female is that rather dull olive bird next to it. Um, the colourful ones are usually the males. And just look, if you look closely, you can see almost the tongues going into that sugar water. And that is coloured sugar water, specially formulated that we feed our sunbirds on. But they don't just feed on our feeders, they also feed on this plant. And it's called the wild duffer plant. It's also known as Leonotus leonorus. And you can see their feet go perfectly in. They probe into the flower to get at the nectar. And these are brilliant pots. We planted that specially to attract the birds and also a whole host of insects. And it's a great plant because it's, um, it's a local plant, it's an endemic plant, and it's water-wise. And that's really important here in Cape Town because Amongst the many crises that we've had here in Cape Town, a couple of years ago, we had a water crisis and we had a major drought and our, um, our water table was really low um, and we had to all save water. And it was an amazing thing, actually, because people all over Cape Town, Cape Townians really rose to the challenge to cut the amount of water they used. They were only allowed to use about 50 litres of water a day. Everybody was saving water. We managed to avoid what became known as day zero, 
when they were going to literally turn the taps off. We wouldn't have been able to get water in our homes and we would have had to go and queue at a communal tap with our bottles and fill them up. And of course, nobody wanted that. So we avoided that day. We then, the next winter, had some rain. Um, our reservoirs began to fill up a bit. However, we still have to be really, really careful with our water. All have to be water-wise. And so as a result, a lot of people have planted water-wise gardens. But I just wanted to show you that wild duck plant. If you see that, I mean, it's a beautiful plant. But there's another really interesting thing about it, in as much that it has a lot of medicinal value. And it can be used for cough, bronchitis, asthma, headaches. So I think this would be an extremely useful plant to have in your garden during this pandemic. Now, I'm not for one minute saying that this plant could cure corona, but I reckon it would probably help you ease the symptoms if you had it mildly. I mean, I don't know. I don't know much about plant medicine, but maybe look it up. It's a plant. Very, very nice plant to have in your garden. Last bird I'm going to show you is one that enjoys our fat ball, and it's this sweet little bird. It's a wax bill. Now, you may think it's sweet, but it's actually a Swede wax bill. That's its name. Gorgeous colours. But look at the bill. What can you see that's interesting about the bill? It's multicoloured. The upper mandible is black and the lower one is red. And it's really prominent. I mean, it's very obvious. You can really see that. And that's quite unusual in birds. I mean, there are birds that have different coloured um, beaks. It's usually a little bit more subtle than that. And I'm going to fire a question at Chris that he can tell you about when we go back to him. And um, he's going to tell you lots of birds that have different coloured bills. But that's ours. It's a little sweet wax bill. So those are the four birds that I've showed you this week. So I think I've showed seven in all. Hopefully you enjoy them. are all beautiful birds that we get in our garden. But if you were watching last week, you'll know that I went down on a little uh, trip down memory lane. And I, I think at times like this, we all enjoy a bit of nostalgia. And I've worked with Chris presenting programmes for about 28 years. And if we go back to the year 2002, Chris and I were presenting a programme called Big Five, Little Five on um, Animal Planet together. I would go and look for the Big Five, he'd look for the Little Five. So in this particular episode, I went to look for buffalo, here in South Africa, we filmed it in South Africa. And Chris looked for the equivalent little fly. See if you could guess, shout at your screens what that would be. We've got the word buffalo in. It's a bird. It is the buffalo weaver bird. So I did buffalo, he did buffalo weaver bird. So here's the little clip to take you down memory lane from Big Five Little Five. Here we go. Well, Chris, my quest was to find what is clearly the easiest of the big five to see, buffalo. Easy, because they're always in a big herd like this, so mission completed, I'm off then. You think this happy herd of cows behind us is going to satisfy me and our viewers? No, probably not. No. You know, these animals have got a reputation for being the most dangerous of the big five. I know. You've got to get out of the vehicle, get in amongst them, get under their skin. They are highly dangerous creatures, and that is why I am in the vehicle, Chris. We want information and entertainment. Well, anyway, what about danger, you? Danger. With your buffalo weaver, but there's, there's a little bird on that buffalo there. That must be a buffalo weaver. No, bird. You're no, sorted no they're well. not, you see. What well, they're they not, then? you know. No, buffalo weavers actually got their name because David Livingston, as of Stanley and Livingston and all that, mistook these birds, red billed oxpeckers, for red billed buffalo weavers. And he called them buffalo weavers because he thought that they were the birds on the buffalo, but they're not. Common mistake to make then. Well, apparently so. You've just made it. <laughs> Are they interesting anyway, buffalo weaver birds? Well, they will be after I finish with them, thank you very much. Well, you better Birds, get... more interesting than these. Big, smelly, sweaty, sticky. I mean, look at them. Dangerous, though. Buffalo weaver birds, not dangerous. Have your eyes out. Go on, get In a weaving. Flash. Get weaving. In a flash. The last one she was on, Puffin. Puffin, of right. course, yeah. In the breeding season, they've got really bright bills. I mean, those are the two that come to my mind. Jacamars, which are, you know, two connects, all of those uh, sorts of birds. Some of the hornbills. Hornbills. Obviously have multicoloured bills, but I suppose you're right, the, the, the most characteristic one would be the toucan family, which have remarkable, sometimes yellows, greens, blues, 
reds and oranges all on the same bill. They did, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely <laughs> amazing. Now, you're going to have to bear with me with this one, but it's going to get somewhere. Um, I've always had a penchant for looking at news finding them amusing. You know, searching for the wittier contributions from the world's journalists. And here in the UK, you'll remember Freddie Star, a my hamster. Here are a few more favourites that I found from over the years. So in the Second World War, the Prime Minister uh, was returning to the front line by air. Churchill flies back to front. On one occasion, the polar explorer Vivian Fuchs set off on a new expedition. Dr Fuchs off to the Antarctic. In Inverness Caledonian Thistle, a very built, uh, beat Celtic, Scotland's most formidable football team, in a cup match. This is fantastic. Super Cali go ballistic, Celtic are atrocious. Another football one. A small Surrey football team was celebrated by F when they won the game. And then lastly, uh, when there was a massive diamond robbery at the Millennium Dome in London, the headline was, I'm only here for De Beers. My favourite, however, was a story years ago, I think it was in 2018, maybe before, when Essex uh, County Council were wanting to close some of the libraries. And uh, the headline from a local newspaper was Book Black in Onger. Book Black in Onger, referring Look Back in Anger by John Osborne. Anyway, look, where am I going with this? There's been a story circulating, not just here in the UK, but all around the world, about the wild goats that normally live on the rugged, rocky promontory of the Great Orm in North Wales, coming off of that and into the town of Lundudno because there's no one on the streets. And they've been coming in and they've been grazing all sorts of, uh, you know, the, the verges around the town, going into the parks. And this has been covered by no less than Time magazine. So here's the online uh, offering from Time magazine. The Guardian, of course, UK's newspaper has reported this. The BBC website has, all, has also reported this, but none of them, none of them have risen to the challenge of coming out with, you know, a brilliant headline, except the Metro. So think about it. The goats have come off of Great Orm, they've come into the town, the Metro came up with this town's Coming like a goat town. Now that <laughs> is awesome. In honour of the specials, this town's coming like a goat town. Whoever wrote that, I salute you. Oh. I absolutely salute you. What a fantastic headline. That, that is, is genius. That, that is pure. Absolute genius. This town's Amazing. coming like a goat town. I found that the other night whilst I was in bed and it kept me up for an hour laughing. <laughs> Makes we look good, eh? <laughs> yeah, I think we should. So I've got my laptop here set up. So some of your questions are all coming through. And um, what are you feeding your birds there? Or are you feeding them sunflower hearts, aren't you? Sunflower hearts, yeah. I mean, we've got some peanuts, and out there there's another feeder. Where I've got some dried millworms in, but they're not very popular. I think that's close to yeah, I sometimes put a bit of sprinkling of millworms into the sunflower hearts. Are you feeling a bit oh, behind my back? If I'm feeling like they deserve a bit of a treat, you know, well, like your, your culinary like skills it. are going into the bird feed, that's well. Well, you've got a bit of a party, mm. haven't you? Mm, okay. If I had to eat sunflower hearts all day, every day, I'd get very bored. Anyway, um, this one is a very good question, actually. Please can someone clarify for me if during the nesting season, do birds choose a mate, build a nest and then breed, or do they breed first and then build the nest? Choose a mate. Choose a mate. First, build a nest and then mate. Um, and obviously, birds don't have what we call intromittent organs. You, you can look that up. So the mating process is a bit hit and miss, to be delicate about it. And as a consequence of that, to ensure fertilisation, they invariably have to mate very frequently. And then the eggs are laid almost immediately afterwards. So basically, the first thing you do is to choose your, your mate. And then the second thing to do is to make sure that when you've started making, you've got something to lay away. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it's find a mate, build a nest, and then um, start the reproductive process. Yeah, yeah, okay. very good. And another question says, I have a starling nesting in my cooker hood. I love hearing the nest preparations, and she's very, very noisy. Will the fledglings be able to climb out through the roof? Well, our starling fledglings mm. are pretty robust. They're I mean, big, they're, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're large. Long-legged. 
obviously. Mm. Um, and by the time they fledge, they're, they're very boisterous and quite strong. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, without seeing the precise dimensions of your cooker uh, hood flu, um, I, I, I mean, if the adults can get in, I imagine the youngsters will get out with a bit of flapping. I suppose the key thing to say is just don't turn the cooker hood on. Otherwise, you might be seasoning your sausages with starling, which one? <laughs> no one wants that. Which no one wants. We don't want that. You've got starling. Is there one more? You go on to my photo. Oh, no, just go on to your photo. Okay, look, so I, I use Instagram to look at photography in the main, and there are some amazing photographers posting their work on there all the time. But I do have a hashtag that I follow, which is simply hashtag sparrowhawk. Sparrowhawks are my favourite bird. So, again, normally late in the evening, go onto Instagram, see what's been posted from the uh, Sparrowhawk admiring society around the world. I found this one yesterday. What about that? So this was taken in the UK. I'm, I'm afraid to say, I, I, I kept the point of reference, uh, i.e. the people that posted it, but it's on my camera. Uh, there was something like the Braithwaite, but if you hashtag Sparrowhawks, you'll come across some remarkable images. I love this one. You know, it's a little male popping out from behind a car, no doubt in pursuit of something that it's got a hunger for, which is pretty cool. Cool. Very, very cool. We're going to do Skull of the Day. Yeah, we're going to round up Skull of the Day quickly. I'm aware that we're running over again. This is getting longer and longer, which is great. But I'm going to quickly wrap up this. So this is a bird that many of you probably will have guessed who it belongs to. It is something where the legend depicts, but it's a bit ominous, and it's meant to pass messages between the realms of the living and the realms of the dead. Um, but I feel like this is a bit of a bird rep, and we need to give this animal some really cool, positive um, feedback, because it's an amazing bird. Of course, this is the skull of a carrion crow. They are remarkable. Look at that formidable bill, those big eyes, and as Chris said, small brain. Now, with birds in general, we didn't really, well, we didn't used to give much thought to the idea that they had strong cognitive abilities. We didn't expect that they would be able to do the things that they can do. Um, however, what we know now is very, 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 so we know that Crows, called they've also called this family, are the most intelligent of the bird species. They are just, just remarkable. They can engage in reasoning skills. They can switch between rules very quickly if they're playing puzzle game tests are found. They can um, facially recognise other crows as well as other human beings. They can solve numerical puzzles. They are smarter than many of our own children and including, they rival that of the great apes, of course. So there's been lots of studies done looking at their brain. Now, they've got very, very small brains. The reason for this is, of course, because they have to be able to fly. So they need to be very lightweight. In fact, a carrion crow's brain, well, we're trying to work this out. So a, a raven's brain weighs 15 grams. So I, I guess this bird's brain would probably weigh about I think, eight, eight, to ten. eight to 10 grams. And the density of neurons packed in this little bird's brain is so high it's probably about one to one and a half billion neurons in that brain, which is so, so much denser than our own. So size isn't everything. It's all about the density of neurons. Um, so they don't actually have a neocortex like we do and other mammals do, which is normally we, we thought is um, an indication of high order cognition. What they do have is a group of nuclei, and this is called... Um, Oh, let me get this right. I've always, I always pronounce this wrong. Um, this is called the where is, where is that called? the pallium. Sorry, the pallium, which is a group of nuclei which we now know is all uh, aiding in their cognitive abilities. They are remarkable things. And considering that the last common ancestor between mammals and birds was three hundred million years ago, we know that this intelligence evolved independently to our own, and that's something called convergent evolution. It means that. Um, intelligence has evolved separately on different lineages at different times. So that means it's really important, of course, to be intelligent, particularly if you're a long-lived social animal. Like the crow. Like the crow. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing skull, beautiful skull. So well done if everyone got that right. And if you want to see something truly remarkable when it comes to problem solving in the crows, Google New Caledonian Crow Test or something like that. Uh, these birds have the ability to, um, thanks, that's not kissing me on, you know, uh, at the long time, um, the, uh, they, they have the remarkable ability to solve a sequential test. And I was fortunate enough to once to go and see these birds in action whilst they were actually doing it. It's absolutely amazing. Well, yeah. we're coming to the end and we normally like to finish 
with that poodle slow mo. But Wait. today the poodles are going to take a back seat because Michaela Scott is going to play us out. Uh, tomorrow, <laughs> do join us. We've got Martin Hughes Games on. Goodness knows what he's going to be doing. <laughs> but we look it's forward to great. whatever it's it is. So great. today we're going to say goodbye from the UK Yay. and finish with Michaela over there in South Africa. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Chris, I don't know if you remember this, this parrot. Can you can you see it? Give us a nod if you can remember. I can see Chris, you can't at home. They do, but well, this parrot was used on the Really Wild Show. So if you're a viewer that used to watch the Really Wild Show, you might remember it. And we used it in the games, the Really Wild Show showdown games. And they were these mad games that we'd have two teams and they'd compete against each other and they'd have to do things like pretend to be hummingbirds and collect as much water in their pretend beaks as they could, that sort of thing. And we used to start the games by going, ready, steady. Anyway, my dog Rio absolutely hates this parrot. By the way, Chris, I've kept it. I, I know that you would have liked it in your house because it is a thing of beauty. Look at that. But anyway, so we used to go, ready, steady, go. But my dog, every time I do that, absolutely attacks the parrot and attacks the pillow on the bed in the bedroom where the parrot normally lives. So I'm going to go, ready, steady, go. And then we're going to show slow mo Rio attacking parrot and pillow from Cape Town. Have a great day. Enjoy your birds. Bye bye.